Hey, this is Andy. Uh, I botched the recording for the second lecture in person on campus uh, last week. And so rather than try to be auto to dub over the audio and recreate things, uh, I'm actually going to show a the 2020 lecture that we recorded during the pandemic where I've shipped out all the student names and everything. Um, so I apologize, but the, the 2020 lecture should cover most of the things that we discuss uh, in this class here. So uh, the original title of this lecture on the schedule was Advanced SQL. Uh, and every year it sort of bothers me because I feel like I'm lying to you saying that it's Advanced SQL. Uh, so I, I renamed it to Intermediate SQL. Uh, so again, I, I'm assuming that, that, you know, that everyone has seen some basic SQL in their life. Like the language is, is what, 40 something years old now. Uh, so I just want to spend the time today going on, going a little bit deeper into some more interesting things you can do with SQL. Advanced SQL would be things like lateral joins and other stuff that like, we'll get into that maybe later on, but not, not today. Um, so where we were all left off last class, if I can click, boom, okay. Where we left off last class, uh, we were talking about the relational model and relational algebra. And we talked about how that the, the whole purpose of the relational model and what, what Ted Cott proposed is that instead of us having to write low level, uh, you know, like, you know, instructions to tell the database system how, the, how we wanted to execute our query, we instead provided a high level instruction and say, this is the answer that we want you to compute. And it was up to the database system to figure out how to, you know, what was the best way to actually execute that, that query to produce the, the result that the, the, that the user wants. So again, the main takeaway, what we're, what we're sort of focusing on is that we're allowing the user to specify the answer that they want, but not necessarily how to, how to compute it. And then that sort of seems like an obvious thing now, or it's a different way to think about, think about programming, but this, this frees up the, the database system uh, to do whatever it wants to do in terms of executing your query in the best way that I think is possible. And this can go all the way down from the storage stuff, which we'll talk about next week, to how you actually want to execute the algorithms for the joins or whatever else you're doing. Like all of that is abstracted away and left to the, the implementation, which is, is a very powerful concept. So how the database system is going to generate this query plan is a complex process called query optimization, which we will, we will talk about a few weeks from now before the midterm. Um, and this is, this is like the black art of database systems. It's the hardest part. Uh, I say this every year. If you, uh, if you know how to do query optimization, we're putting query optimizer here at Carnegie Mellon. So this is something you're interested in and get involved in. Like I can get you a job immediately because everyone has this problem. Everyone that's building a database system has this problem and they can't hire people fast enough for it. Um, so the high end systems, so think of like Oracle and SQL Server and DB2, uh, but even to like, you know, the, the sort of the, some of the open source ones like Postgres and MySQL, they're gonna have sophisticated query optimizers that can do query rewriting and uh, basically execute a, a search algorithm to try to figure out what's the optimal ordering uh, for the operators in your query plan. Again, that's not our purpose today. I'll show an example of what Postgres can do, um, but this, this will come up later on when we talk about query optimization. But it's underneath the covers, think about this is what the system's actually doing. So the, the history of SQL, uh, it goes back to the 1970s. Um, so SQL was developed by IBM, uh, these two guys, Chamberlain and Boyce, because they were developing the, uh, the query language used for this database system that IBM was building called System R. So again, the history of, uh, of the relational databases is the 1970s, again, Ted Codd proposed the relational model, but he was a mathematician, but he wasn't actually gonna write the code. So uh, some IBM researchers in San Jose all got in a room took Ted Codd's paper and actually tried to build the first implementation of a relational database system. So System R was the first one that came out of this, uh, out of this work. Uh, there was another IBM system that's less famous that actually was, was in England um, that I think actually might predate System R. And the thing about it, it has like this weird experimental band name, like, like so nobody thinks it's a database system. It's called like the Peter, the Peter Lee Relational Vehicle uh, which again, doesn't sound like a database system, but that was another famous, uh, sort of, not famous, but another relational database that IBM was building. That one was in England, that didn't go anywhere. System R is the more famous one. So 
the first language that, they, that these two guys wrote before they wrote SQL was this thing called Square, uh, which is the, the specifying queries as relational expressions. And that language was super complex and difficult to write. So then the second one they wrote was, was SQL. Now, if you notice it back in the day, back in the day it was spelled out S-E-Q-U-E-L because uh, it was the structured English query language. IBM got sued by some other British company for uh, trademark infringement because there was another language for some manufacturing company that called, called, called SQL. So they did shorten it to be SQL. Um, so, but this is why like, people like me or like a lot of people still you know, don't refer to it as SQL. We say the full word, the full word SQL because it comes from its, what, what its original name was. So uh, IBM uh, put this out in the 1970s. Uh, the other sort of famous relational database system being built at the time was Ingress out of, out of Berkeley. Uh, they had their own query language called Quell. Uh, this was developed by Mike Sternbaker, the, the inventor of, um, of Postgres. Um, and so again, the SQL is a play on words because it's the SQL to Quell. Uh, so that's also where the, the, the name comes from. So IBM did this in System R. Uh, they never commercialized System R, but then they had a bunch of offshoots of it, System 38, SQL DS, and DB2. DB2 is the most famous one of all of this. I, I don't know whether these guys are still around, but DB2 is still, you know, still alive and kicking it and making them a lot of money. Um, and so you know, IBM was the juggernaut uh, software company back in the day. So whatever IBM did, you know, people just sort of adopted the same thing and assumed that would be the standard, right? Certainly not that way now. Uh, but Oracle was in the 1970s, they were copying everything that, that IBM was doing. Like the founder of Oracle, Larry Ellison, would literally call on the phone to IBM, the guys building System R, and say like, hey, if you put a bad query in, what error code do you get back? And like, he would, he would end up copying whatever they told him on the phone, right? Um, because, I mean, anyway, that's a side comment. But the point I'm trying to make is like, the reason why Oracle is the juggernaut now and not Ingress even though they were sort of both at the same time, is that IBM put out SQL with DB2, and that's sort of what everyone adopted. And Oracle was at the right place at the right time, supporting what uh, IBM's language was. So then it became an ANSI standard in 1986, and an international standard in 1987. And again, that, that's when they short -term, short, shortened the name just to be uh, structured query language. So even though SQL is uh, from 1974, it's certainly not a dead language, right? There's, there's updates for it all the time, periodically. Uh, the latest version is uh, SQL 2016. Um, and you can see these are sort of the major versions in the last like, two decades. Uh, and you just see all these new features getting added to the language. Now, the core structure of SQL is always the same, like the selects and, and, and the deletes, insert, and updates. But now there's like new functionality you, that, that you can use within those basic query constructs. Um, and so the, the JSON stuff, for example, that like, you know, that's sort of common now in NoSQL systems, and that's a good example of where the, you know, the, 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 the caretakers of the SQL language are adopting sort of new technologies or new concepts or new um, uh, concepts that help people program database applications and, and you know, keeping SQL up to date with these things. So the minimum support you need or SQL syntax you need to say you, that you can publicly announce and say that you support SQL is defined in the SQL 92 standard. So again, this would be basic things like the select insert, inserts, update, deletes, the create table statements, the drop table statements, uh, transactions. I said, if you're building a database system today and you say, I support SQL, the, the minimum you need is, is this. And this link here will take you to the original spec of, uh, or the, the SQL 92 spec, like the text file. Okay. so. One thing to also point out too is, uh, although there is a standard, and as we'll see this today when we start doing demonstrations, the no one database system adheres perfectly to the standard. And this is partly because uh, the, the consortium or the, the governing body for the SQL standard is like a bunch of people from various database companies. And so they show up representing their database company trying to get their new features in that their, you know, their database system supports and try to force everyone to adopt the same thing. Uh, and so I would say in terms of who follows the, the standard the best, I'd probably say Oracle is the best, but then maybe, maybe actually Postgres after that. Um, but like, again, like even though there's a standard, not everyone's gonna have all these features and for the features that they, they do have, the syntax will be slightly different. 
All right, so SQL is a, uh, the, the specification is a, is, a, is a combination of these three things. So the data manipulation language, that's the, the, the commands you use to either read, you know, retrieve data or, or modify data or in, in the database. Then there's the DDL where you specify what the data actually looks like. And this is, goes beyond just tables. Like you can specify indexes, you can specify namespaces, triggers, functions, a whole bunch of things, right? Declaring the metadata for your database. And then there's the, uh, the DCL, the data control language. This is a specification for like security ACLs and, and other things like that. Like, you know, who can read what data. There's a bunch of other things in this as well that, you know, we'll sort of cover out throughout the semester. Like you define views. I would say that's part of the DDL. Uh, integrity and referential constraints and specifying what values, uh, what tuples can take on in, in tables. And then trans transactions are going to be a really important concept. That's going to specify how we can do a bunch of operations atomically uh, on, in, our, in our database. So another important thing to point out too as well is that SQL is going to be based on bag algebra, not set algebra. So in the last class when we talked about the relational algebra, that was entirely based on sets. Uh, so there's sort of three basic sort of data uh, collections you can have, right? You can have a list, right? That's where you can have duplications and there's a defined order. Like I, I can append things at the end of the list. You can have sets where there is no order, but you cannot have, and you can't have duplicates, right? If I insert one key, if I try to insert it again, I have to fail because the key already exists. Bags don't have orders like sets, uh, but they can allow duplicates like lists. And so the reason why we're going to do this in our database system is because it's going to make uh, a lot of query processing or, 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 or sort of operators and algorithms we want to execute. It's going to make them way more efficient if we can allow for duplicates, right? And we'll, we'll see this when we start doing group buys and things like that. Uh, there's ways to enforce uh, the removal of duplicates but like that's, you're telling the data system but the actual work you want to do. Like, so by not having to worry about duplicates as we process queries, we, we, it, it'll make our life a lot easier. Again, this will make more sense as, as we go forward. All right, so for today's agenda, we're going to start off with aggregations of group buys. Then we're going to do a quick crash course on string, date, and time operations. We'll look at alpha control. How can you, can you specify how much data you want to get out of a query and where to actually put it? And then we'll focus on, on, at the end, what you'll need for the first homework assignment, uh, doing nested queries, CTEs, and window functions. And again, please, uh, you know, please, please interrupt if you have a question, and, and I'll, I'll clarify things. OK? So for today's, uh, all, all of today's uh, examples for SQL, we, we're going to use the following database that's modeling a really simple college. All right, we have, and we have three tables. We have students. Uh, we have courses, and then students can be enrolled in courses. So there's a foreign key reference from the student ID here and, and the course ID here. Right? Again, th this will be what we use as our running example. So the first thing to discuss is aggregations. So the way you think about an aggregation is it's a, uh, like a function where you're going to take a, a bag of tuples that you're, that you're you know, in, in your query, and then you're going to uh, collapse them down into a single scalar value. Right, so like, say simple thing like a count. I want to count the number of tuples. That aggregation would take a bag of tuples, count each one by one by one, and then produce a single scalar value that tells me the number of tuples that I have. So these are the basic five aggregations you get in the SQL 92 standard, average, min, max, sum, and count. Uh, you can do other things like standard deviation, um, geometric means, like you can go beyond these, but like the, the basic concept is the same. And different database systems will have support for different types of aggregations. And some systems will even let you define uh, you know, a specialized aggregation function, but it, it'll work the same way. So let's say that uh, in, our, in our sample database, we want to count the number of students that have the at CS login, right? So all I need to do is my query. I have my, my, my from on the student table. My where clause has a like, which I'll explain what that is in a second. Just think of this, it's just, it's just matching like a wild card, like a, like a regular expression. Um, and then we have our aggregation function that says count the, count the number of login fields, right? So, right, this is pretty simple. Uh, but there's one thing to point out here is like inside my aggregation for a count, I'm, I'm asking to count the login field, but I, I, I don't actually need to do that. Like, like it doesn't really do anything because I'm not actually looking at the values uh, 
of the, the login attribute. All I'm doing is just seeing, you know, you know, does this exist for this tuple? So you can actually replace the, the contents of inside the count function with a star that's a, a in, in, in SQL, that's a wildcard that says give me all the attributes. So again, this, this, there's, no, there's no semantic difference between this approach. You can even simplify this further and just put one, right? So this is saying count the number of ones that appear for every single tuple that matches this. So it, it just, you're just adding up all the ones. Again, these are all produced the same answer. I, in general, I say for this, the, the database system will be smart enough to recognize that like, I don't need to materialize all the tuples if I have a star and it, can, it, it would just rewrite it as this. Right, so you're passing less data from one operator to the next. All right, you can do multiple aggregates in the same, uh, in the same query. So here we're gonna do average GPA and so count the number of students that have the, the at CS login and we wanna compute their average GPA, right? And so you do this and you would get an answer like this, right? You can also add a distinct clause for the count sum and average, right? And the idea here is you wanna get, you wanna count the number of distinct uh, values for a given attribute for all the tuples that you're looking at. So in this case, case here, I'm again getting all the students that have at CS and I'm counting the number of distinct login uh, handles that they have, right? And, and again, and it reduces it down to a single scalar like this. Now this example is kind of stupid because it's like you would hope that everyone has a unique uh, login. So you wouldn't necessarily need to have this. And so the database system could be smart enough to recognize that uh, this thing is, has to be unique because I declared it in my, in my schema and then not do anything special with the distinct. Is there, a question? Andy, there, there is a small question here. Be, yes. What is the best uh, style to put as count arc? I did not understand myself. Sorry, I, I think he's asking this. I, is, is the question, what is the best argument to put in here? Can the student can, unmute? Can, can the student unmute and tell you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yes, that, that's it? That's the question? Yeah, like which, is there a preferred style in the industry? So the question, okay, okay. All right, there's two, actually, maybe there's two questions. First question is, is there a preferred style in industry? No. Uh, you're going to find this in the real world that there's like, like, you know, there's like linters and formatters for like, you know, C++ and Java and any programming language you want out there. Uh, there are that there there are those for SQL, but like as far as it, people don't really enforce that very 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 often, right? Um, I think the better question though is what is actually would be more efficient? And again, I think the database system will be smart enough to recognize that like all these are are, are semantically the same. So when it's computing the aggregation, uh, the way you would compute aggregation is you, you would basically build a hash table internally and just update this count for everything that that matches here. Um, or actually in this case, it's just a running counter. You don't even need the hash table. So for this one, I don't think there would actually be any performance difference. We can try this afterwards, but I don't think that, I don't think it'll matter. So there is one small question that what is the difference between like and equal to? All right, this will come to you later. Right, so we'll get, get, let's hold off on that for now. We'll talk about string matching later on. Equals is like something has to exactly match. Like is, is like a wild card. Like the little percent sign is, Okay, this is like SQL syntax. The percent sign is like the dot star in regular expressions. It's, all, it's the wild card. Again, we'll come to that in a few more slides. Okay, um, so let's say now we wanna do, uh, we wanna get the average GPA of the students enrolled in each course, and we wanna know what that course was, right? So if we try to run this query like this, uh, where we just have now the course ID as the output list for our select statement, uh, depending on what database system you use, this may or may not work. Uh, in some systems, you, you will get an error because you can't actually specify a, a column like this, right? Uh, that actually, no, sorry, this would work, but it's unclear what you, what you actually will get because I'm getting the average GPA, but I have no way of like specifying what course is actually you know, being taken here. So what'll show up here will be completely random and we can try this in, in a bunch of different systems if you want. So what we really wanna be doing is using group buys. Where now what's gonna happen is we specify at the end of our select statement, group by on a course ID. And now we can specify the course ID up in our select statement. So what this will do is this will bucket up every single uh, course by their course ID and then compute the average of the GPAs for everybody within that course, right? 
So you take all, all like this, so you would take, uh, you take the course ID, you would bucket them up, and then for each of those, you would then compute the, compute the GPA from that. Right, so again, this is, this is allowing you to basically divide up the, the, the data based on one or more parameters. I, I have one here. I, I could have a comma separated list of a bunch of other columns. And then within that group, it then computes the aggregation for all the tuples that match that. Right, and it just goes like that. Okay, so the point I was trying to make before though is like if you now have a group by clause, but then you don't specify, then you have columns in here that are not specified in the group by clause, like, in, in the, like, we're, like we're trying to get the student name here. In some systems, this will work, but you'll get you know, a, a, a weird answer. You get something unexpected or it's random, right? In other systems, if they follow the SQL standard a bit better, <clears throat> they will say, you can't, you can't do this. Um, and so the only way you can actually run those queries is, is if you put the student name down here. Now, for this example, it's stupid. It, it's not a good, you know, this is sort of a useless query because this is grouping by the course ID and getting the student name, right? But every student can only take a course once, uh, at least in our database. So the average GPA of the, of the, based on the course ID and the student will just be that single student's GPA. But the point I'm trying to make here is that again, you can't have anything up here unless it's also being included in the group by down there. All right, so uh, if you now want to start filtering based on the output of an aggregation, you can't do that in the where clause. So let's say in this case here, I want to do that aggregation on, by the course, uh, the course ID and get the average student GPA within every single course. But I only want to show the courses where the average GPA is greater than uh, 3.9. So you would think in this case here, I could put the average GPA greater than 3.9 because right, I'm aliasing the average GPA to be called at, you know, average underscore GPA. So I'm trying to reference this column, the column that's generated here inside my where clause. But you can't do that because, again, just thinking about how the, the query is actually being executed, by the time you're, at, you're processing the, the tuples one by one, you don't know what the average GPA is because you haven't seen all the tuples. So there's no way to, to reference this thing up here. You know, this thing, the thing that's computed up here, down in here, because you haven't computed it yet. So you would then, so the way to get around this is through uh, the having clause, where you can now, you can specify after an aggregation what the output should be. I don't know, I, I shouldn't actually show this. So this doesn't work in a bunch of database systems, right? You can't, this still doesn't even work, you can't even reference it. What you still actually need to do is actually recompute the, the GPA down here. Now, I don't know why they don't let you do this, because what's gonna happen is it's not actually going to compute this twice, even though you're specifying twice. The database system is gonna be smart enough to recognize, oh, well this average GPA that I'm computing here, well that's the same thing that I'm computing up here, so I can just compute that once and then do, do my filtering there. Some database systems will let you do this, some systems won't. I think uh, MySQL will let you do this, Postgres will not, and SQL Server will not, and well, we can try this later. SQL Lite might, might let you. But again, the main takeaway here is that like, the, this is a way to do filtering after you've done aggregations. You have to put it in the having clause. You can't put it in, in, in the where clause. Right, and this is just showing you what the output would be. Okay, so that's aggregations. Any questions about that before we proceed on to string functions? Okay. So now we're gonna start getting into the part of SQL, as I said at the beginning, where the dialects of these various database systems are going to differ. Uh, and it's going to be frustrating because you would think, okay, SQL is a standard. Like, you know, I can, I can, you know, you know, I, I can take my SQL written from one database system. I should be able to, to plop it over and use it on another SQL database. The answer is going to be no. And we'll see why this is going to be, uh, this is going to be hard to do. So the first thing I've got to deal with is, is string operations. So, the SQL standard, the SQL 92 standard specifies that strings have to be case sensitive, right? and then the, we will reference them using single quotation marks. But as you can see here, everyone is going to differ wildly. And as I said, Postgres and Oracle, actually DB2, they follow this pretty well. Uh, they follow the standard. My SQL and SQLite are, um, you know, are, 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 are variable. This one drives me the crazy the most, that fact that the strings are, are case insensitive, right? So that if I'm trying to take, uh, I'm trying to take somebody's name 
I can run the string function upper to make all the letters uppercase. Uh, and I have to do that in order to match anything else, right? Like if, if, if I want to put anything else uppercase. In MySQL, you don't have to do that. You can have whatever case you want for the letters within the string and it'll still match. Um, I haven't checked to see whether that still happens in the new version of MySQL, but we can try that right now if, if, if we want. Um, the other thing too that also burns me is uh, I started, when I, my first database I ever used was MySQL 3 back in like two, the early 2000s. Uh, and it's one of those things I had like muscle memory. So when I write queries and I write strings, I always put double quotes because that's what we did in MySQL. Uh, and that, that always fails whenever I go switch to another database system. And it's, it's, a, it's like a bad habit of mine. All right, so this was the like operator that somebody was asking about. So like is how we're going to use for basic string matching in, uh, in SQL, right? So you can have a like operator and then what comes at like, so you take, take the, the column name, then you say like, and then the string that comes after that is, is the string pattern you're trying to match. And the two basic characters you can have to do matching would be the percent sign, which is uh, one or more character or any, any, any or yeah, one or more character, uh, including empty strings. And then the underscore is, is uh, match exactly one character. So again, this is like, this sucks because like we're used to, you know, using the star in like, you know, the, the bash terminals or whatever, whatever you're using it to represent wildcards. For whatever reason, the percent sign is, is the wildcard in SQL. Now there are, uh, there are regular expressions in SQL. Uh, that's one where I think that again, the SQL spanner center specifies what you can do, but the, the, the different database systems support different functions to call the, the, the regular expressions. Um, and usually they're Perl, compa Perl compatible, uh, but I, I don't know about like the commercial guys like Oracle or, or SQL Server. All right, and then there's also gonna be a bunch of string functions. I showed upper in the, in the last slide. Uh, the SQL standard is going to have a bunch of things you can do that, that, as you would expect on strings, like trims, uh, upper, lower, uh, substrings. And you can use these on the output of, uh, you know, you can use them any, any part of, of the where clause, or sorry, any part of the SQL statement where you're referencing an attribute. So you can either put it in the, the select output or you can have it in the where clause, right? It can be on either side of, of, of a predicate. Um, and, you know, again, and every single data system will support these, these basic functions. The thing though that you would think would be super easy to do and common across all the different database systems would be string concatenation. The problem is though, everyone does something different. Uh, so the standard specifies that you use double bars. This is what Postgres does. This is, my, uh, this is what Postgres does. Uh, Oracle does this. SQL Server uses the plus operator and then uh, MySQL doesn't use either of these. We'll try version eight just now, but like they instead have a concat function. And so if you want to concat a bunch of strings together, you basically uh, you know, call in these, all these nested concats. Um, but let's play around this real quickly and see, see what happens. All right, can you guys see my terminal? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Oh, well, let me log in my other laptop because typing, I have a Windows Surface, but it sucks at typing. Um, Okay, so we're gonna have, um, oh, is, it, is nothing showing now? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. All right, you guys see that? When no, it screen, no. It was screen sharing, because uh, you, always, you always saw it, right. All right, so this is post. Or so this is uh, this is Postgres, right? So if I want to do like simple string and cat, uh, I have to do Andy, and then like that, all right? And get that. So now let's try this in uh, MySQL. So this is MySQL version version eight, and it gives me zero. Right, that sucks. Uh, maybe I try the plus. Nope, didn't like that. There's a bunch of warnings, it doesn't like me. Let me try the dots, this probably maybe just fail. Nope, didn't like that. 
What you can do, though, is not have any operator and just have, and just have like spaces in between the strings, and that works. That sucks. All right, uh, let's try SQLite. They, they support the pipes. That worked good. That worked well. Let's do SQL Server. Did not like the pipes, so we'll switch to dots. Didn't like that. Maybe they're the plus. There you go. They do the plus. Again, string concatenation should be super simple. Everyone does something something different. Either they should all they should all have the concat function though. That should be standardized. Okay. The so and there is a small question, but I also did not fully understand what is the relationship between relational language star and SQL spec. Is the mathematical is theory backing it? Wait, so, um, we said again. What, what the question is? What? Sorry. Uh, what's the relationship between relational language star and SQL spec? Is mathematical theory backing it? I I I think like. Can per the person unmute themselves or? Sorry, I, I typed it wrong. I meant, what's the relationship between the SQL language spec and the relational algebra? I meant relational algebra instead of relational language. Is it, is it the mathematical theory backing it? Like, why do we mention relational algebra if this is like bag? Okay, yeah. So the question, I think your question is, is we did, last class we talked about relational algebra. Now we're talking SQL. What's the connection between the two? So yeah. the, the, the SQL is a way to specify a query that can then be executed using relational algebra. So uh, probably the easiest way to show something like this would be, we, we, so we can look at the query plan, right? Um, and you will see how like these basic operators that we've talked about, um, Postgres is gonna be the best at this. So let's say that I have, um, I have the student table and I join it with the enroll table on, I think enroll with student dot SID equals enrolled to SID, right? So that, that's our join. So you can use a command called explain in front of your query. And that's just gonna tell you like, give me the, give me the query plan. So now this is actually the physical query plan of what the database system is gonna execute. This is what, this is what the optimizer is gonna generate, right? And so it's, it's basically a tree structure, but in, in the side of the tree, we have a sequential scan and we don't have a filter in here, but like think of that as like the select operator for the, that we talked about in relational algebra. The difference though is the relational algebra is a logical definition of the, what the plan should do. This is a physical manifestation of it. Meaning like the, the relational operator for select says, hey, read this table. It doesn't tell you though how to read it. So what the database system is doing is taking the SQL query, converts it into relational algebra, then converts it into, which is, which is logical, and then converts that into a physical plan that can be used to execute the, that query to produce the output that's, that's needed by the relational algebra. Does that make sense? Got it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, all right, so let's let's head, let's look at this dumpster fire. Okay, dates and times. Okay, this is where things are, are even worse. So this is where things go uh, go awry. So again, the SQL standard specifies how to operate on dates and times, uh, but the it's the sort of unwritten implicit behavior of them sometimes that that can vary, and then the syntax for all the operations you want to do are going to be widely different as well. So uh, let's do an example again, uh, which, what we think would be a really simple query, right? Just we want to count the number of days from now until uh, since, since today, since, since the beginning of the year, right? So again, we'll do this on all three different database systems. So uh, the first thing we have to do is figure out how to get, like, what is today's date, right? So there is a now function in the SQL standard, and then that'll just, you know, that runs, this is Postgres again, it tells you at the bottom what we're running. So this is Postgres, and this will give me the timestamp of, of today, right? 
So I can run that same function in MySQL. I can get the same thing. I can run this in SQLite. Tell, but now it says there's no function. OK, well, that's problematic. Uh, and then I can run this in, in SQL Server. Doesn't have, doesn't have now. OK, well, there's another way to get the current time. So uh, there's another function we can use called current timestamp, right, a bit more verbose. And again, that'll do the same thing, except Postgres doesn't have the function called current stamp, timestamp, but it has the keyword current timestamp. Oh, I was off. OK, so now let's go to MySQL. They have the function. They have the keyword. <laughs> SQLite. No function. They have the keyword. SQL Server. No function. They have the keyword. Okay. So, all right. So again, something really simple. What is what is today? What what's the current time right now? That that varies. All right. Um, so now. We want to figure out a way to get the, again, we want to figure out, we're trying to count the number of days since the beginning of year to today. So there is a, uh, there is a date type, right? And we can do casting in, um, in, in SQL, right? So today is what, 0902, right? And this is, this is just taking the string and now casting it into the date type. So now that we again, there's some basic functions we can do in this. Like, you know, maybe we could uh, extract the the day from 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 this you know this timestamp, right? But that doesn't really help us because that's just telling us it's been two days since since the beginning of the year. Um, so the way to do this in Postgres turns out is all you need to do is cast the string you know for for today and then beginning of the year and just subtract them. And that gives us 245, right? I haven't done the math, but I, I'm assuming that's correct because it's, you know, it's roughly about right. Okay, so let's try to now do this in uh, MySQL. But it gives us 801. What is that? So every year I give this demo, I don't, I, I, I'm like, I, sometimes it's, it's like 728 or some other number. And I'm like, what the hell is this number? Somebody on YouTube, believe it or not, actually then told us what, what it is. Uh, it's the, the first digit eight is the, is the current month, uh, our current month subtracted by the month we're trying to take the diff on. So, so we're in, we're, September is nine, January is one. So it's nine minus one is eight. And then the 01 is again, the current day of today's date minus the, the day we're trying to get the, the difference from. So the 02 minus 01 and it gives us one. Now, I think the type of this is, uh, uh, is is an integer and not a string. So so like this is bizarre. Like this, if you run this query, you'd be like, "What the hell is this number?" Like for every time I run, I'm like, "I don't know what this is." Um, so the next thing we can try to do then uh, is the solution I came up with was to convert the today's date into a Unix timestamp, which is the the number of days, or the, sorry, the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. That's the, the Unix epoch. So we convert today's date uh, into a, the Unix timestamp. Uh, and then we subtract that number of seconds by the number of seconds from the beginning of the day, beginning of the year. And then we divide it by 60 minutes, 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24 hours. And that gives us 245, right? So, that, so that's sort of bizarre, but that's one way to do this. But then I found out that uh, MySQL has a date diff function where we we'll, we'll just you know, cast it as a date, and then you, you, the date diff will then give you exactly uh, that value. All right, so that's, what, that's one way to do it in, uh, or two ways to do it in, um, in MySQL. So now let's try this in, uh, in SQLite. So SQLite does not have date diff. Um, and so the way I figured out to do it, other than using, uh, using, uh, uh, sorry, using Unix timestamps was to convert the dates into the, the Julian calendar, which is the number of days since like, I don't know, 400 something BC. I think it's when Julian, Julius Caesar was born. Um, 
and then that will give you uh, roughly uh, the right the right the right value, which we can then just cast as cast cast as an integer to get two forty five. All right, so now let's go. Last one would be SQL Server. So uh, if we try to do what we did in Postgres at the beginning, um, and uh, and just you know subtract two dates, that doesn't work because they don't have the date type. Um, they have a date time type. So what we'll do is we'll call the convert function to convert the, the dates into the date time, and then we'll subtract the two date times from each other. Right. That gives us uh, that gives us um, you know September third, nineteen hundred, which I don't know what that is. Um, but then I found out they do have they also like MySQL. They have a date diff function, so we can basically do the same thing we did in MySQL, right? Take today's date, uh, subtract it by um, beginning. Sorry, no, that's wrong. That should be beginning of the year, right? So today, take today's date, subtract it by beginning of the year and base it on, on days. But that gives us negative 245, right? Again, just going back to my SQL, right? I did today's date first. Where are we? Today's date first, subtracted by beginning of the year. I do that same thing in, uh, in today's date, subtracted by the beginning of the year in, in, in SQL Server, and I'm getting negative 245. So if I just now flip the order, of the arguments, then I get positive 245. So again, you see how frustrating this is. It's like, uh, it's like the simple operation, but you can do it in, in, a, in a bunch of different ways in all these different database systems. It sucks. Um, all right, so any questions about this? Okay, so let's keep, let's keep moving ahead. Um, all right, the, uh, where's my clicker? Let me turn off this over here too. The, uh, all right, so the next thing we gotta worry about is uh, output redirection. So again, in all the examples that I showed you, when I run a select statement, the output comes to my terminal. If you're writing an application, it'd be the same thing. Like it, it, the output would go to the, whatever who has the connection open that, that made the query request. Um, but maybe there may be times where you don't want the output to go back to the terminal, you actually want to store it back inside the database so that another query or something else could start, start using it. So this is what output redirection can do. So you're basically taking the output of a select statement and you're putting it somewhere else. Now, the table does not always have to be defined. Uh, like you can, in this case here, you can call select out, sorry, you can call create table here and then have the select query be, be what generates or populates the, the table. And the database system will derive the schema from the from what the for the schema for the table based on what the query is outputting, like it knows, oh, this course ID is an integer, so I'll define a, a you know a column called CID that that will be the integer type. In the SQL standard, you call select into, and then you specify here that where the table has to be. I think for this one, I think again, this one also does not have to exist uh, in in the SQL standard. You can insert in tuples into it, another table. Uh, so this is like, this is basically what it should, right? Or this is the insert clause. And instead of having a value list, you have the select statement, right? So w although the syntax for this is gonna be the same across different database systems, where they're gonna vary will be what they do when, they, when, when there's an error, right? So like, there could be the case where the, I'm trying to insert into a table that has a primary key, and therefore I can't have duplicate values. And now I do this like select query like this, where I'm doing the insert based on the output of the select. And I come across now a value that already exists and that violates the uniqueness constraint that I have on my table. Well, some systems will throw an error at the first violation that, that they find and then roll back any changes that they've already made to the database. Like anything that got inserted before I hit that error, I undo all of them. So as if the query never executed. Some systems will throw an error and stop the insert but they keep all the things that already got inserted. Uh, other systems will just straight up ignore the error, give you a warning at the error that at the end that there was an error, but keep everything else that, that it inserted. So again, the SQL standard doesn't really specify what you should do, or at least I haven't looked at this in particular, but like everyone is doing something different because it's just based on how you know the one person that implemented it, this feature back in the day, this is just what they did. 
right, the next thing we can also do is control uh, the how much, how much data we're going to uh, spit out from our select statements. Clicker's not working. Yeah. Is this frozen? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, right. So the the order by clause is used to, to generate the sort order that we want for our select statement. Again, if we're based on bag algebra, there is, the, the, the data can store the tuples in any way that it wants. Uh, it won't even store it. You're not even guaranteed that it's going to st store them in the way that you insert them. Right, well, we can see examples of this later in the semester. But just because I insert you know, tuple one first followed by tuple two, when I run my select statement, there's no guarantee I'm going to get back one followed by two. The database system is left to sort, store it any way that it wants, right? The bag algebra semantics says there is no defined order. So if we care about order, then we have to add our order by clause. Uh, and then we can specify what column we want to sort on and then whether or not we want it ascending or descending. Right, so in this is a simple example here where I'm getting all the students in uh, 15, 7, 21, I specify I want them to be sorted on, on grade. And so I, in the SQL standard, if you don't specify what order you want, the default is, is ascending. Instead of, instead of providing also the, the, the column here, you can actually just give an offset of the, uh, the output lists here. Actually, that should be a two, right? Because it's, it's based on one. So this is saying that of my output list, I want to order them on the first attribute or, or should be the second attribute here. And that, that's the same thing. So that's useful when you have things like, uh, like an aggregation or something that may not have a defined name or alias for the, the, out, the output field in the, in the select output. So you can just say, I want it sort of based on this offset. You can then combine this with multiple things. So you, you can do uh, sorting in, with multiple columns and each one can be sorted in a different way. So this is sorting based on grade in descending order followed by student ID in ascending order. But it's important to notice here is that I can sort by grade, even though my output list doesn't specify that I want grade to be included, right? So, it, so the database system will know that as I'm scanning the enroll table, I have to maintain the, the grade attribute and the tuples in my intermediate results as I'm going along, but I'm, I'm gonna need to sort that by that value later on, even though it gets projected out uh, later. Again, the same thing, I can just specify the, uh, I can specify the, the number that I want here for, from the output list as well. All right, next thing is that the limit clauses. Limit clauses is a way to, uh, to you know, essentially limit how much of the output you're gonna get from the query. The way to sort of like do early termination to say, I've, I've gotten all the data that I need uh, or and, and, you know, don't do any further processing. So you can specify how many tuples you want to produce as the output. Then you can also specify an offset of where the where the limit sort of calculation should, should start, right? So this one here, we'll, we'll get all tuples, I'll get, you know, do the scan and then produce 10, 10 output tuples. This one says, skip the first 10 and then give me the remaining 20. So this is why they used, and uh, like any website where you see like, you know, it show you, shows you 10 results and you say, click, give me the next 10. If they're using SQL, they're basically doing this with a, a limit with an offset, right? But you have to be careful because depending on what the query is, uh, you may actually have to look at all the tuples, even though you, you, you specify a limit. So for example, if I, I want to get the top 10 uh, values of some attribute uh, and you know, sorted by that, that value, I got to sort the entire, the entire table, then look at the top 10, right? There's no, where, there's no way you can shortcut, shortcut that very easily. Um, so just be mindful of like, you know, even though you're saying, I only, want, I only want 20 tuples, you may have to look at all the tuples in order to compute the answer that you're looking for. Um, I, this is just a duplicate. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure what happened there. All right. All right, so any questions about output redirection, output control? Okay. All right, so now let's get into the good stuff, right? Let's talk about nested queries, window functions, and CTEs. So, Nested queries are a way for us to, to, to embed one query or, or multiple queries inside of another query. The way to think about this is like, just you know, let me treat it like, like, a, like a function call, right? So say I'm doing this query here, I wanna get the, the names of the students that are, that, are, that are enrolled in at least one class. So in my, uh, I have my outer query here that specifies what the output's gonna be, but inside my where clause now, I can embed another query. 
So the terminology we would use is that this is the outer query. That's the, the, out, the, the uppermost query that then produces the output that's sent back to the terminal or the client. And then the, anything in, that's embedded inside of it, it will be a, uh, the inner query. The, you can have any arbitrary number of nesting. So like this inner query can have another, its own inner query, right? You can pretty much do this uh, infinitely. Obviously you can't in a real system because you would overflow the stack, but like, and maybe some systems actually cut it off at some point where they say, I, I can't do any more nesting. Um, but like, again, from a syntactic standpoint, you, you can do this for, uh, forever. So I would say that like, these are super useful uh, and in the open source databases, especially MySQL in recent years, have gotten much better at handling them. Uh, oftentimes the, they will do the, the, sometimes you'll see some data systems, if you give it a really bad nested query, they'll, they'll do the dumbest thing, which is execute the inner query for every single tuple of the outer query, right? So like for this example here, Say I have uh, a thousand students and, and a thousand records in the student table. So now in my where clause, I want to see whether that student exists in this other table here. So the dumbest thing to do would be for every single student, go scan the entire enroll table and then check to see whether that current student is, is inside of that, right? Uh, so what query optimizers are going to try to do is they're going to try to rewrite this as, as, a, as a join because that's going to be way more efficient than you know, doing the sort of brute force search that I just said. All right, so look, 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 look some more complex examples. So say you want to get all the students that, uh, that are enrolled in uh, 15445. So the way to think about how you want to write this is you want to start with the outer query and think about what is the output result that you want to produce. And then you work your way inside and say, okay, what does my inner query need to do to figure out how to filter the tuples uh, that I need? All right, so in this case here, just writing in English, here's our outer query. We know we want the name of the students, and then we want to be able to match them where, uh, for every student if they're a student that's enrolled in uh, 15445. So we know that there's going to be an a, a inner query here where we're just going getting all the student IDs for the students enrolled in 15445. So the question is now, what, what do we put here as the output around this? Well, this is just, again, that in clause we had from before. So this is, again, saying, Find me a student ID that's within this, this set here. So the important thing to point out is like we're referencing student ID twice, right? Because both the student ID, student table, and the enroll table have student ID, but this inner query is bound to this one, and this uh, this SID is bound to the, the outer table here. All right, the other ways you can you can operate on uh, nested queries that are that are producing multiple rows is you can use all, which says that. All the rows have to be satisfy your expression within in the subquery. The any says that at least one row has to match in our subquery. In is basically equivalent to equals any, right? So these two guys, you have to say like, you specify like, you know, greater than, less than, equals, all, or any. In is just a shortcut way to say equals any. And then exists is just a way to say, as long as the inner query produces one output record, I don't care what it is, I don't, know, I don't care what's in it, as long as it, that returns uh, at least one record, then my predicate will evaluate true. Right, so going back here again, this is just a way to rewrite the in we just showed before. We can say where the student ID equals any student that matches uh, in, in, the, in the enrolled table. In this example here, the, the nested query is inside the where clause. Uh, the nested query can appear anywhere, right? You can actually have it in the select output. So this is running, this, this is producing the exact same result as, as this query but it's just flip things around. So now the outer query is the enroll table where I'm just gonna scan through, find all, the two, find all the students that are in course ID 15445. And then for every single one that is enrolled in this course, in my select output, I'll do a lookup into the student table and get, and, get their, and get their name, right? So again, semantically they're the same, the database system is probably, it will be able to re probably rewrite this one as a join, which is the most, most efficient thing to do. This one here probably will, will have to get rewritten as a, uh, as a, you know, as, as, as a, well, it probably runs at once in Postgres, materializes the result, and then reuses that. Uh, but the dumbest thing to do would be, again, for every, for every single tuple that's matching out here, you know, do the probe into the student table. All right, so let's look at more complex things. So now I'm going to find the student record with, this, with the highest ID that is enrolled in at least one course. So you would think you want to do something like this, right? I want to do a join on the enrolled table and the student table. 
uh, and I want to get the max student ID and just get their name, right? But as I said before, this won't work in, uh, in most database systems because you can't have the student name uh, the, the reference here because it's, it's, it's going to produce, you know, it's, it's not actually matching to, to the thing that we're computing the aggregation on, right? We can, we can do a quick demo of this. Um, all right, so let's get started in Postgres. So this was what select select max student ID student name from enrolled as E student as S where E ID equals S ID S to S. Right, this throws an error because again, we're specifying, we're trying to access the student name, but it's, we're doing an aggregation. So it doesn't know, you know, doesn't know how to bind it. Um, actually, one quick thing to show too as well, like this is like old school join syntax. Like we have like sort of like, you have now the from, you have your, all your tables and then you specify the join predicate in the where clause. Uh, the preferred way of doing this now would be, you would write join like this, and then you replace the 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 where clause with the on with with uh, on, right? So that'll work. Again, I'll try to use the um, I'll try to use the correct syntax. But it just, if you've never seen it before, you you don't have to specify join when you want to do a join. If you just have in the where clause, the data system is smart enough to know that that's my join predicate. So let's try the same query now that was failing in uh, in Postgres in MySQL. So MySQL throws an error, which is good. It didn't always used to do this. Uh, so there, in, in you know, probably, actually, probably two years ago, MySQL would let you do all sorts of like, you know, things that violate the SQL standard. And so they had this thing called SQL mode where you can specify uh, what syntax is allowed in, uh, in MySQL. And so if you, if you set it to, to traditional, which is, uh, you know, prior to like, you know, a, a newer version of MySQL 5.7, this is, this is MySQL 8, right? With traditional mode, you can do all the quirky things that, that you're not supposed to, supposed to be able to do. So this here, now, now we can actually run this query and we see we get the, um, we get, we're getting the right uh, student ID, but the name is Tupac. Um, but if we go look in the student table, Uh, so student ID was 53688. 53688 is Justin Bieber, not Tupac, right? So this is a good example. Like, again, it doesn't know how to bind the student name to whatever tuple or whatever the values have been using for the aggregation. So it's giving you garbage. Is there a question? Uh, Andy, uh, the, the multiple students have the, they're confused about uh, all and they want to also ask about the difference between exists and n. Right, the questions are, uh, going back to the slides, it's about um, these guys here. So the question is, what does exist do and what does all do? Yeah, and the difference between exists and any. Okay, so exists, all right, so like, let me do a quick example here. Um, all right, let's do Postgres because Postgres is, is I think follows the, the standard better. So all of this is doing is saying that uh, whatever predicate I have, like as long as something in my inner query returns, my, as long as the inner query returns one tuple, it, that, that's all it needs, right? So let's say I do from student uh, where clause, and then I can just have exists select one, right? So you can have a you, you can have a query without a where clause, right? I can do select one, and all that does is return one, right? And and you can treat the database like a calculator. I can do one plus one, right? So this query here is just saying that for my inner query, it returns one tuple that has one attribute and the value is one. So as long as this thing returns true, uh, like the long as this like long as one tuple gets returned, the exists will be satisfied. All right, so if I think I do this. Uh, I guess null is a tuple too. But let's, let's make a fake table. Create table empty. 
and it has an ID field. All right, select star from empty. There's nothing in there. So now they go back to this guy, select star from empty. Now returns nothing because exists as something has to be in there, but my little fake table that I made that doesn't have anything in it doesn't return anything on when I, when I call select. So therefore this, this now predicate evaluates to false and no tuple satisfies, All right? So that's exists. So you think, okay, well, this is stupid. How do I actually use this? Well, you can use it for things like, um, and because the inner query can reference the outer query. Uh, or so yeah, the inner query can reference things that are in the outer query. So like the outer query here is, is select. So now in my enroll thing, I can say, uh, let's do as E, where the student ID equals the outer, the outer table student ID. So that what this is doing is this is returning, this says as long as there's some tuple that satisfies this predicate, and here now I'm matching the student ID from out here inside my inner query, and that's producing the, you know, that, that's returning some tuples and it, it, and it comes back as true. All right, so now with all, it's the, the idea with all is that we're trying to, um, well, we have a predicate that says, uh, the way to think about this, we're, we're, our inner query is gonna be based on a, uh, uh, if, if, if the inner query returns back a list set of tuples, then our predicate has to match for every single value that's in all those tuples. So let's see what I mean by this. So say we have now, um, say we have our uh, student ID out here, and we say that the student ID has to be greater than all tuples that are gonna be pr produced by the inner query here, right? So my inner query, I can put, again, anything I want, I can have it just return, you no, know, nine, 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 nine. So now this predicate is going to say, for every single student, checks to see whether their student ID is greater than all values that are returned by this inner query here, which none should match. So you get nothing. So let's maybe use that that empty table to make this make make this a bit more clear. Um, insert into empty. values, so we'll put 9999 and zero. So now my empty table, which is no longer empty, I have two tuples, 9999 and zero. So now if I go back to this guy here, select star from empty, this will, this will not match anything because it's going to look at every single tuple that this inner query generates and it's going to evaluate that the student ID is greater than all of them, which it won't be because one, one of them is 999. If I now delete from empty where ID equals 999, now they all match because they're all greater than, than zero. Uh, so Andy, there is one question on the chat. I did not fully understand it. Like the student is asking whether the ex uh, the exist act as a boolean in way that it returns a true or false. Uh, does, yes, exist returns true or false. Yes. So a good important thing to understand about this too is like this is taking a scalar of this tuple, and it's going to match it against multiple tuples from the inner query. But they actually have to return, they only return one value because that's the value you have to use to match against this thing. So like if I go back to my example here, right, 999 returns, uh, that return, like this inner query is returning one value, one tuple with one attribute. If I now make a return multiple things, this should throw an error, right, because this, the, the inner query here is returning too many columns so I can't compare against student ID. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, this one, like, we, I think we covered this one, right? Again, the main thing here is that uh, you can have it in the where clause. You can have it in the select output. You can actually have it in the uh, the from clause. All right.
So let's now see uh, a way to get the, the next query we want to run is we want to get the student record that has the highest ID that is enrolled in at least one course. So again, uh, and then we covered this, right? The way we actually want to do this would be, we, again, this is the outer query, this is what we want to produce, and we know that our where clause has to have the highest enrolled student ID. So we know that there's going to be this max query on the enrolled table, and that'll give us the, um, you know, that'll give us the one, one tuple with the one value that's the max student ID. And this is the question is how do we replace this match here? What the in clause would do that for us, right? We can also rewrite this as now we can use, uh, instead of using the, the max aggregate, again, we can, instead of doing an aggregation, we can actually just do an, an order by, based on the student ID in descending order, limit it to one, and then that'll produce the same answer. In many cases, like, for the, depending on what's more efficient, it's, the database says, could we write it, this max query to be this order by, or could do it the other way around? Again, depending, it depends on the implementation. There's so another way to do this. Now we have in our from clause, we're doing a join on the table, or sorry, on the on a sort of a, a synthetic table that's the output of, of that that max query, that gets materialized into this again temporary table called max max e, and then we can reference that in our join clause just as we would you know as if it was a real table, like it's an ephemeral thing. The database system will generate this 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 table, uh, materialize it somewhere in memory, and then does the join and then blows it away when the query is done. All right, so uh, one more example. Uh, how do we find a course that has no stu tuples enrolled in it? Right, so this, in this case here, we use not exist because we said we're basically saying as long as no tuple matches whatever in our inner query is, uh, then, then that'll produce the answer that we want. Right, so now we just have that select statement where, where we're doing it's essentially a sort of inner join, in, or not, not the right word, we're doing a sort of a, a join internally in the subquery where the we're referencing the course ID of the outer table, or the outer, outer query, and the enrolled ID of the inner, inner query. And then that's essentially doing a join to find the answer that we're looking for. And then 823 is a class that I taught when I, when I started at Carnegie Mellon, uh, but I, I haven't taught it since then. All right, so any questions, questions about nested queries? Wait, um, can we go back a few slides? I, there was a query that you said that didn't work. And I was, I'm still confused on why it didn't work. This bit. one here. Yeah. Reason why it doesn't work is uh, because you're so you're doing an aggregation. What does an aggregation do? It's taking multiple tuples and coalescing them into a single scalar value, right? But now I'm trying to reference the the for all those tuples that I, I I collapse together. I'm trying to reference some some attribute of them. But like, which one? Like I had a, say a thousand tuples to c compute the max student ID. But now I'm referencing a student name, like which student? And so I showed the, showed the example in, uh, with MySQL, if you, if you put it in traditional mode, it'll, it'll let you do it, uh, but it, the, the number that, the name it's actually giving you is wrong. SQLite will, will have the same issue as well. Wait, but by, yeah, by aggregation, where is the aggregation happening? What do you mean? Where is the aggregation happening on the from clause? No, the aggregation is happening on, on the output list. Oh. Right? So, so you do this join, right? And just think, you, 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 like, ignore the aggregation. You're doing this join. Now you're going to generate a list of all these tuples that match your join clause. Then now you then compute the, 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 the max value of the aggregation. Oh, OK. Right. I see now. I okay. see now. Yeah. yeah. I see. Any other questions? Uh, shit, it's already 4.30. All right, um, let's keep going. All right, window functions. Because right, I, I want these in CTEs because you, you have to need these for the, um, for the, uh, for the homework. OK, so window functions are, are going to be like aggregations. But instead of collapsing the tuples into a single aggregation, you're going to compute the aggregation on a sort of incremental fashion. And then you still produce the original tuple as the output. So this is useful when you're doing like time series analysis and you want to compute things like a moving average. But as you're processing the tuples, like you're, you're computing the aggregation, you still want to know what was the value of the tuple you were looking at at, at individual time ticks. So the way you would do this is that 
you specify that uh, you have a function uh, over some aggregation, and then you can, and then the the over clause specifies like what is the how you actually want to group together the 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 uh, the tuples, right? So my battery's dead. Right, so I, I keep clicking the zoom thing and I lose, I lose focus. Right, so this is the aggregation function and then this over clause is, is, is essentially gonna specify how we split up the data and we can sort it in, in you know, doing more than just the group by we had before. So we can do all the aggregation functions like we had before, the min, max, sum, and count, and average, uh, but they now have special window functions that can do other things like now give us the position of what row we're looking at in, in our window. And then we can cho choose also now the rank, meaning the order position uh, as, as we sort them. So in this query here, what are we gonna do? We're gonna go scan the enroll table. And then for every single tuple, we're gonna compute a row, a row number. And we're gonna synthesize that as this row num attribute here. So it just looked like this, right? So as now I'm scanning uh, the enroll table, I'm maintaining a counter that's telling me, you know, here's your row number, right? This is pretty, so this is, you know, this is pretty simple. It works in Postgres, MySQL, newer versions of SQLite. And uh, in case of SQL Server, you, you can't have an empty over clause. You have to have a, an order by in there. So the over keyword is, is an important part because that's going to specify uh, how the query should group the tuples together when it's computing the window function, right? So say this query, what we're doing now is that we want to get the row number uh, or compute the synthetic row number of the tuples as we group them by the course ID, right? So it would be like this. So, we, so for every single course, we have all the tuples that are the tuples been enrolled in it. And then there's a row number that's specifying, you know, here's their position within, within that group, right? It's essentially, it's like a group by, but I'm still getting the tuple and I'm having my, my aggregation uh, being computed on the fly. We can also include an order by clause in the window to, to sort the, the elements of each group. Um, and so the, the way to think about it is like you're doing the, the, you're doing the sorting and then you compute the aggreg aggregation. It's a, again, it's another way to sort of split things up. So let's look at function like this, or qu query like this. So we want to find the student with the second highest grade for uh, every single course. So this would be sort of tricky to do now in a, uh, again, without a window function because you have no way to know what is the position of the tuple if you now start sorting them or grouping them based on their, uh, in, you know, on the course ID. So in our, in this one here, we have an inner query. Let's focus on the red part here. The inner query is gonna uh, do a uh, rank function over the, uh, over the, oh, sorry, where is it? Rank function over the enroll table ordered by the grade in ascending order. And we're gonna split them by course so that now we end up with for every single course, well, we'll have the sorted list of students based on their, you know, based on their grades. And then they will be all going to be assigned a rank telling their position in that sort order. And then we can then in, in the outer query, we're referencing the, the, the table that ranking that gets materialized by this inner query. And we can specify that we only want the tuple that uh, where the rank equals two. Right. And this is just looking like that. So let me, let me show this really quickly. I think it'll make more sense when, uh, when you see it actually running. So we'll use Postgres again to start with. Right, so again, we the rank over partition, rank over, the, compute the rank over the, uh, for, this, for the only enroll table, and we're gonna split them by course ID, and then we're gonna order the elements by their grade. So if I, if I remove this, this outer query part, Right, and just run the inner query, you can see what, what the output actually is. Oh, right, there you go. Right, so in this case here, again, now you see that for every single course, I'm sorting them by grade, and then now they have a rank position within their, within, you know, within their group. Right? So, any questions about this, or is this clear? So students are asking, what is the difference between rank and row number? Row number is your position just in, in, in the output list. Rank is your sort position. Right, so if I do this. Uh, 
if I remove the order by clause, one, two, one, two. Let me, let me try to give, give, give an example where it comes up different. One, two, three, four, five, and then Yeah, perfect. Okay. So in this example here, the rank is is one one three three five five because in their sort position, the, we were since we we're sorting by the course ID, these two tuples have the same value. So technically they should be in the same position. Right? So the rank is one. Up here, when I was doing it uh, by the row number, it's one, two, three, four, five, because it's just the output as they come out. All right, so, so, is, so is this clear? All right, so, but, but now, say if I go back here and I do a multiple one, so I do order by uh, grade, I think I can then specify also, sorry, by grade as well. Now the rank should be the same thing as the, as the, the row number, because the, you know, the grade here is the, is the tiebreaker. All right, any questions, other questions about window functions? Okay. CTEs. CTEs are awesome. Um, CTEs are way, they're going to look like nested queries uh, because you're taking the output of one query and then using it as the input for another query. Um, but it's different because you're, you're, you're going to declare it a, before you have like, you declare the CTE first and then you can reference it down below. So you add this, this, this with clause here, then you specify the name of the CTE and then you can reference it as if it was a table down below. And again, think of this as like an ephemeral temp temporary table where it's only bound to this, this query that's running down here. When the query finishes, anything I materialize for the CTE gets blown away. So we'll see some examples of things you can do with CTEs that you cannot do with, uh, with nested queries. All right, so uh, the way it works is like you sort of think that you declare the CTE as if it was like a table. So you're gonna specify column names you don't have to specify the type because the, 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 since SQL is declarative, you can derive what the type is going to be based on what the output of the inner query is going, going to be. Um, and then, and now down below, I can reference the, I can reference those columns and do whatever I want them. So this is now declaring a CTE called CTE name. It only has two, two columns, one and two. And then here's my select query without a from clause that then produces a single tuple with the values, you know, uh, one and two. Turns out though, I found you can do this in Postgres and I don't recommend this is like, you, you, these column names don't actually need to be unique. My SQL throws an error, uh, Postgres does not. So you can do this, right? You, you can specify that these column names are the same, but then down below it recognizes that you're trying to use, it, it doesn't know how to bind the, the name of the column to whatever the output of the CT is up here. So Postgres won't let you do this. Uh, you, you have to rewrite it as a star. And in that case, that, that's totally fine with Postgres and lets you do that. All right, so let's see that example we had before where we're trying to find the, the, highest, the student record with the highest ID that's enrolled in this one class. Again, instead of having the nested query uh, down below inside the from clause, I declare it as a CTE where now I'm computing the max student ID from the enrolled table. And then now in my, my bottom query, I just reference this thing as if it was a, a, another table. All right, so that's not that exciting, right? where things get awesome and what, and this, what CTEs are what make SQL Turing complete is you can do recursion. So if you add the recursive keyword, this allows you to then invoke the CTE uh, on itself. And then that keeps, keeps going uh, until there's some, some recursive, uh, you know, until there's some halt, halt uh, condition. And then it fires off the, the query down below. So what this is going to do, this CTE is going to recursively call itself to print out the numbers one to 10. Think of it just like as a for loop, we're just going to keep outputting, uh, you know, take where the current counter is, add one to it, and then recursively call the next counter and get the next value. So what this is doing this is it's going select one and produces a single tuple with the output one. And then I'm doing a union where I'm going to combine whatever the value, the, the, at, the output of this query with the output of this query, which has a recursive call now into itself, 
to take whatever the counter is that's getting bound, adds one to it, and then repeats the process over, over and over again. Right? And then we have this where clause to specify when to terminate. Okay, so let's see some examples of, of, of this working. So we can get stuck in an infinite loop if, we don't, if we're not careful, right? So, um, so here's a really simple CTE, right? Here's the example that I had before, I'm oh, sorry. Here's the example I had before, right? Select one, uh, you know, our CTE called CTE name has an output column one, and, uh, column one, column two, and all it does is produce the output uh, directly in our, in our, um, in the, in the query down below. So we can run that on, uh, in Postgres. That's fine. We can run this in MySQL. That's fine. We can run this in SQLite. That's fine. We can run this in, uh, SQL server. That's fine. So that's good. So now let's see the example we had about, uh, the for loop. Right, so again, I'm calling a recursive CTE where the first uh, value that I'm generating is just the value one. You don't actually need the union at all when you get rid of that. Um, and then I'm gonna union that with the output of the counter that's being passed in plus one, but then I call, call the CTE again. Right, and you get the output list, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like that. Right, again, it's essentially think of like, you know, we're treating this like a for loop. Let's try to run this in, uh, in some other databases. My SQL let, lets us do it. Um, SQLite doesn't let us do it because it doesn't like recursive. And then uh, SQL Server doesn't like it either because it, it doesn't know how to deal with recursive. So uh, recursive CTEs are super powerful, but not everyone's going to support them. Let's see now what happens if I don't have that, that where clause here where I'm saying stop when the counter is, is less than, or keep going as long as the counter is less than 10. So what I'm gonna do in Postgres is I'm gonna set this timeout variable to be 10 seconds. So this is a, this, this is a Postgres specific parameter that specifies how long query is allowed to run before I kill it because you know, it's, it, it ran too long. So now if I run this, uh, if I want to basically the same query, where I'm gonna call recursive CTE and do that to, for, you know, recursive call into itself, but I don't specify, oh, that one did it. It's the union all, that's why you need this. If I don't have, uh, union all means it keeps going forever. It's like, if I don't have the where calls to say when I should stop, then it will run forever. But unless my timeout is set to 10 seconds, right? In this case here, Postgres says I timed out and I go ahead and kill it. All right, CTEs are often confusing for students. I'm sure there's questions, go for it. If any. Okay, cool, awesome. So um, again, as I said in the beginning, SQL is not a dead language, right? It's uh, there's always, uh, you know, there's always new features being added to it. Different data systems support different things. And a lot of times the new releases, they will add new, you know, new SQL features for you, uh, which is super cool. Um, the, when you use like a, an ORM, if you're using like Django, Ruby on Rails, Node.js, where they sort of abstract away the database system, there is a sort of mapping layer that knows how to take whatever the operation you're trying to do in like your, your Python or Ruby or JavaScript code and convert that to the uh, various SQL statements. And in those cases, they, they usually don't try to use the specialized features. It's only when you write SQL by hand, you end up falling into the trap of like using specific things that the data system support. Um, the, when for the homework, which is next, um, you're gonna wanna strive to write your SQL queries always in, in like try to compute the answer you want in a single SQL statement. And this is gonna allow, because now the data system can see the complete view of what you're trying to calculate uh, compute and generate the potentially the most efficient plan. Like if you, you, like instead of using nested queries, you could break it up into sort of, you know, a bunch of selects that go put things in temp tables and then have the final query. Uh, but that's going to be way, it's going to be less efficient than if you had a single query that you just send to the database server 
and let it compute everything all at once. All right, so homework one is going out today. Uh, so this year, what we're giving you is a, uh, a sample database generated from the Music Brains. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically an online uh, encyclopedia of like a bunch of album information and artists. And so we're asking you to write queries in SQLite. This is allow everyone to write, you know, test things on, on SQLite locally. SQLite, if you have a Mac, is already installed, and it's Linux. It's super easy for Windows. It's also super easy. Like SQLite should run anywhere. Uh, and so everyone should be able, you know, be able to do this locally. And then you would submit your queries to Gradescope, and then we'll run the same thing on SQLite up there. And then it'll, it'll tell you whether your output matched or not. So you can submit as much as you want on Gradescope, but obviously don't use it for debugging, right? Because it's useless because it's, you know, you're, you're better off trying to, you know, trying to figure things out as much as you can locally. Uh, and then the, uh, it'll be due on Sunday, September 13th. All right, so any questions about the homework? Quickly. Okay, so next class, we'll do storage management. Again, now we're actually, this will be pretty much the most we'll see of SQL uh, this semester. Everything going forward now will be how do we actually build the data system that can execute those SQL statements, okay? Dang cold, taking this toll. I got a pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a dub, show some love. We for 50, is you with me? What I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's some. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake.